Greetings, Maple Leafs fans, and welcome to Maple Leaf America. This week, we're in the state capital of Ohio, Columbus. And I'm standing in front of the beautiful nationwide arena, the home for the second year Columbus Blue Jackets. We'll take an in-depth look at this franchise. We'll meet a former Maple Leaf known as The Mouse, and we'll check out some college hockey. It's all ahead. Stay with us. Maple Leaf America is next. Welcome back. Here we are outside the Nationwide Arena, the home of the Columbus Blue Jackets. I love the architecture, kind of an old style for a new building. Before we actually go in the building and check out the franchise, we're going to take a little Ohio road trip, about an hour and a half to the west, to Dayton, to meet a classic hockey player, former Leaf, Guy Trottier. And that's my figure skater. Uh -huh. Are you my favorite skater? A scene often repeated in this house during the past 37 years. Guy and Diane Trache playing with kids. First it was sons Danielle and Gilles, and more recently, the grandchildren. Why leave a place that's always been so magical? I mean, hey, Guy scored 185 goals in Dayton for the IHL Gems from 64 through 67. I had a few good years up here, and uh, I really enjoyed it. We were packing the place up. I mean, we were in a small, small arena, and the air arena was 4,800 people. It was really close to, to the players, and the, the fans really got involved, and it was a nice three years. I really enjoyed it, and, and I had some great success. I had some good players play with me, too. A hat trick with the Gems meant winning a set of tires from a local rubber company. One season, Guy won six sets of tires. In 1967, the AHL Buffalo Bisons came calling, and then the parent New York Rangers in 68. Emil Francis came down, he was in Buffalo, we were playing uh, Rochester, and I really, I really had a bad, terrible game at that uh, Friday night in, in, in Buffalo against Rochester. And Emil came down after the game and says, oh, I'll pick you up tomorrow, you're, you're playing at the Leaf, against the Leafs tomorrow night. So, so that was a shocker. <laughs> and he said, well, I thought I asked him about long, because he treated me real well. Uh, one thing about Emil, when he tells you something, this is what's going to happen. No points in two NHL games, then back to Buffalo for two AHL Calder championships in a row, right up until a trade to Toronto for two full seasons. I was scared because uh, of the reputation of the Leafs. Uh, just to go in this, that building, it was unbelievable feeling, unbelievable. Even when I played with New York as, as, as a game, when they called me up, when my legs were shaking, my whole body was in convulsion. It's, it's unbelievable the magic there is in that, in that old Maple Leaf Garden. It, it was unreal. And then you go to camp with them, you're in that building in training camp, and it's just unbelievable. Pictures all over the wall from old players, and good players, superstars. It just bottle your mind. And then when, they, you, know, when they, you go for the warm up, you get 18,000 people in the building. Plus, probably another four million, two, three, and two, three million watching you on television. Well, you could be looking good, or you looking really bad, <laughs> and they let you know. <laughs> this is 1969. Stick that Toronto Maple Leaf had a contract with CCM, and when I signed a contract with uh, with Toronto, I wanted my own stick made by Victoriaville. So they decided to get Victoriaville in. And I had all these guys signed it. Stick aside, with Guy being our first French-Canadian former Leaf profiled, we had to ask, what about Anglo versus Franco concerns, especially back then? I really got along real good with the fans. That's, it was amazing, because since I was French, but I don't think they saw that I was French. I, I, don't, I don't believe they did. Because the Toronto fans are, are they're a different breed. They're really going to pull for you. I mean, they're really, they, you think they're cheering against you, but you're, you're, they're not. They really try to help you out, and they'll do everything. And people in, in, in Toronto, was, they were great to me. Maybe it's Guy's infectious smile, or the laugh, or the nickname. The Mouse dates back to his first pro season in the Eastern League, where, by the way, Guy shared a dressing room with rookie Pat Quinn. That came out of uh, Knoxville, Tennessee. I was really small, and I uh, played in the Eastern League just uh, out of junior and it was a rough league oh my lord i was short 
and I was only about 165 pounds then. And so the, the sports writer nicknamed me the mouse. After Toronto, Guy, like many others in the NHL, accepted an offer he couldn't refuse in the upstart World Hockey Association. The WHA was enticing players with huge contracts. After a three-year run in Ottawa, Toronto, and Michigan, it was back to the minors and, of course, Dayton. After a long retirement hiatus, Trache has been back on skates for 11 years as a volunteer coach for the ECHL Dayton Bombers. If I was making a move to the mill, yeah, if he, if he goes to the outside, he's, he's got, he got no chance to go anywhere. He kind of likes to do things in the background very quietly. He, you know, he, he watches you know, from up top. He's our eye in the sky. He's you know, that voice of experience. And you know, quietly, I'll have him take players aside, go one-on-one. -on -one. And you know, not only you know, his experience as a goal scorer, because Guy's done that. You know, he scored a lot of goals in the IHL and the AHL. But he provides a lot of experience to these guys that having played at you know, the National Hockey League and the American Hockey League level. And he sees a lot of things on the team side of it as well. Guy trache has been with the team since the team's been, been around town, uh, 91, 92. I came in the year after that. And uh, he comes in, he helps out when he can. I know he has another job in that, but uh, he comes in and helps out when he needs to. Uh, you know, he gives the finer points on power plays and just uh, the offensive side of the game. Um, you know, it helps out all the players, and, and I'm sure a lot of guys have got called up because of him. Apparently, coaches have been called up as well. Jim Playfair, as, as a coach, I came here and, and talked to me about helping them. And uh, Jim is in Calgary Farm System in St. John's, won the Calder Cup last year. Then Mark Kumpel followed him, and he's with the Washington Capitals Farm System in, uh, I believe it's in Portland. And we got this young kid, Greg Ireland, that I believe he'll be up there in the National League. Sometime. Guy's the old kid teaching the other kids about life and hockey in the neo French settlement of Dayton. Get you on the Leafs network. Go walking the wide concourses of the nationwide arena, the beautiful home that belongs to the Columbus Blue Jackets. We want to learn more about this second year franchise on and off the ice. When the NHL announced expansion to Columbus, Ohio a few years ago, there was no shortage of people saying, Columbus? What? Ohio? I think I was always a guy who was in favor of expansion. I think it's good for the league. I think that the league wants to get a, a broad national scope in the U.S. and uh, this part of the country, it, it needed a franchise and we're a good fit for this area, I think. Um, the only difficulty with expansion is that obviously, are there enough players? That's always the worry. And, uh, but our team the first year was very competitive. We had 71 points that year and had a good season. This year, our point production's behind where it was a year ago, but I think we're making progress with some younger players. So, you know, I think overall, I think that um, Columbus is, is a real good fit for the league. We've got a very stable owner here, Mr. McConnell. Our franchise is very well run. Uh, we're more than meeting the expectations of fan interest. So I think it's a good move for the NHL. Anti-expansion types didn't buy it. And if they haven't been paying attention, they probably still aren't buying it. But guess what? Wake up, Toronto, Detroit. There's a new hockey hotbed not far down the road. I can honestly be one of the first to admit a lot of guys, from, right when they announced that Columbus was coming into the league, we all were, we're all thinking, I mean, who would, you know, who's going to want to play in Columbus? We never really knew much about Columbus. And then I talked with Lyle in the summer, we went over to Scotland, played some golf, and, and uh, I said, I really would really like to, I really like Columbus. We played here against them uh, last year, it was, uh, it was really exciting, fans are great, and uh, I knew there was something here, and then uh, when I came here, all year this year, it's been unbelievable. I'm really pleased with the way, uh, my wife and I love it here, and uh, we're excited. Before signing here, I, I brought my family down to take a look at the city and the surrounding areas, and um, I didn't know really what to expect uh, of, about Columbus, Ohio, but very quickly uh, we realized it was spread out. It wasn't like a real downtown where there's taxis going everywhere and so forth. It's, it's more spread out and um, you know, there's a lot of country roads and things like that, which uh, uh, I'm a big fan of. It's fabulous here, really. Um, it's a great area uh, to raise your children. Uh, the schooling's excellent. Their hockey programs, having two boys, their hockey programs are really coming along. And um, don't get me wrong, it's not Canada in, in the way that we live, uh, the way our uh, hockey systems are, but uh, it's definitely improving. Uh-huh. 
Well, Mr. Devil's Advocate says hockey in Columbus is a novelty sure to wear off. I think with the foundation we built, the number of kids playing the game, we're seeing a quadruple in minor hockey. We're, when we came here, there was one high school team playing, now there are 12. We have uh, Cincinnati and, and uh, Cleveland are very important to us as well. And I think the foundation we build is going to be here for decades and decades. We're going to continue to work hard and make sure our plan stays in place. But uh, trust me, we're not going to take a day off just because of the success we've had to date. So it sounds like when it comes right down to it, these fans could be in for the long run if they get what fans everywhere want, wins. Dave King is a wonderful coach. Um, I love my ice hockey. I'm from Detroit originally. I lived outside Chicago. So I like my ice hockey. I have two sons who play ice hockey. Um, as far as the Jackets winning, uh, I'll come for the next couple of years. It, it, uh, McLean got very lucky as far as down with the Florida Panthers, and he did it in three years. It'll take longer here. They're, they're not big enough. They're not strong enough. But uh, King is a wonderful, wonderful uh, tactician. So I, I hope, I hope they stick the, uh, stay the course with him. A positive, low payroll and room to work. A negative, small, out physical forwards. An unknown, the upcoming collective bargaining agreement. I would think the Jackets would probably get some trades, hopefully, and uh, put us on the map. I, I'm going to give them three years, maybe soon. Really? I don't expect uh, tremendous patience. I expect expectations, and, and we've got to meet some of them. And, I, you know, I think that the number one thing you have to do is you've got to make sure that the fans' perception is that you're going in the right direction. And I think that's the case right now. But, you know, you can really sense that they, they're, they're becoming much more educated. Um, and they will become more educated, and I guess as they do that, they'll become more coaches. So for all of us, in the end, it's probably going to be more difficult because as fans start to understand the game, they start to try to coach it, and, and there you go. So, but I think it's been great, and we've got fans here now that I think, you know, they cheer at the appropriate times. So th this year you can sense that they're, they're more knowledgeable than they were a year ago. There's no easy way to win in the NHL other than the teams that typically are winning are winning because their draft picks have matured into stars. That, that's the bottom line. Now, how long does it take to do that, and you, can you rush it? We'd like to think so, but it's a challenge. Especially for coaches and GMs in high profile positions needing to win sooner than later for job security. In the meantime, ride the boom. Great building, great infrastructure, a friendly professional approach, and the hottest ticket in town. Well, they've really done things right here at the Nationwide Arena. Columbus Blue Jackets in their uh, second season. Of course, they'd like a few more wins, but those will come with time. What I would like, it's the ninth week, is a name and number on the back of my Toronto Maple Leafs jersey. It's been, uh, it's been quite a while, and I've had uh, quite a bit of trauma trying to get this accomplished. All right, let's see, they got red on them, but there's white. So if I took the I, and I could use the T. Hey, Hey, Andre Zuko. Hey, What's going What's on, buddy? Going on? Right. Assistant equipment manager with the Columbus Blue Jackets. I'm trying to get these jerseys. Can I have a jersey? Oh, no, 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 no. I'm going to help this guy, but we'll be right back. Hi, my name is Pam Weinfeld, and I'm here in Cincinnati, Ohio. I want to say hi to all the arms back in Kitchener. And uh, my favorite leaf is Darcy Tucker. I want to say, go Leafs, go! Hi, I'm Rick Wamsley from Port Dover, Ontario. My favorite all-time leaf is Johnny Bauer followed closely by Jock Plant. I like to say to, hi to my wife, Lori, and my three daughters, Kelly Lynn, Colleen, and Megan in Oakville, Ontario. Welcome back to Maple Leaf America. Now, growing up, I was under the impression that Bugs the Bunny discovered America. But in fact, it was Christopher Columbus, or so he and they claim. Columbus, in the late 15th century, came across the Atlantic Ocean on an expedition with three vessels, the Nina, Pinta, and Santa Maria. This is an exact replica of the flagship Santa Maria, and it is sitting, fittingly enough, in the Scioto River in Columbus, Ohio. First impression, small. 
much smaller than one might imagine for a vessel built to cross the Atlantic Ocean in 1492. This was a big deal. You sort of get a sense of how crude this ship is, uh, and to undertake a, an international voyage on something like this was huge. It was really uh, quite extraordinary. The 30-meter-long sailing ship housed 40 men for 70 days. And it's all Columbus and his men needed, at least for the westbound journey. No pirates, no raging illnesses, no wicked storms. The trip that they had coming over was a piece of cake. Uh, no problems at all. Uh, Columbus used these cannons simply for signaling. They had set up in advance a simple set of signals, and that's how they would communicate back and forth. The big boss, Admiral Columbus, had it the easiest with deluxe quarters. This was it. Columbus had a bed with one of these uh, state-of-the-art Sealy Posturepedic mattresses right here. And uh, on the bulkhead here, we have a representation of uh, the way they thought the world was. Columbus uh, was trying to open up trade routes to the west, since their overland trade routes uh, through Asia Minor had been interrupted. Wait a minute, we've overlooked one essential element to ocean travel. Where did these guys go to the bathroom? Well, uh, we've taken a bit of a tour around the ship and have not found it, but uh, right by my right hand is the port side gentleman's restroom. Uh, and then on the starboard side of the ship, we also have a similar restroom, and your choice would be based on one thing alone, and of course that was the direction of the wind. Unless requested, that little factoid is usually left out of the costumed presentation put together for school kids from April through autumn. Classes that come from all over the state of Ohio as well as uh, outside of the state of Ohio. We have uh, tourists from Pennsylvania and all around. But this is a great educational opportunity for these kids. They get to see life as a 15th century uh, sailor. What we're doing in the wintertime is exactly what sailors have been doing for uh, thousands of years. At the end of the sailing season, you strike the uh, masts down to the deck, you pull the yards off, you take the sails off, uh, and then when the sailing season begins or the fishing season begins, you do the opposite. The duplicate Santa Maria is fascinating, but what happened to the original, the one Columbus left behind in Haiti in 1493? The real Santa Maria was lost on uh, Christmas Eve of 1492. Uh, they did what sailors don't really want to do, and that's find the bottom on an unscheduled basis. Okay? punched a hole in the bottom of the ship, and it, it began to take on water, a la the Titanic. So they had enough time to salvage uh, virtually everything off of the Santa Maria, and then it disappeared without a trace. Love traveling around the state of Ohio. And I'll tell you what, there's more hockey than what we're showing you here in the Buckeye State. I'm on the banks of the Ohio River in Cincinnati, right outside the first Star Center, the home of the East Coast Hockey League Cincinnati Cyclones. There's also the Dayton Bombers and the Toledo Storm that participate in that league. Much more ahead from the heart of it all. That's what they call Ohio on Maple Leaf America. So come on back. I'm uh, Ryan Vince. I'm from Amherst, Ontario. My uh, favorite leaf would definitely have to be Dougie Gilmore since he uh, lives about 10 minutes from my place. Um, I play now with the Dayton Bombers and I'd like to say hi to uh, everyone back in Amherst, and including my parents, my two brothers and all my buddies back home. Hi, my name is Steve Ostasevich. I'm the manager of multimedia for the Columbus Blue Jackets and I'm from Grimsby, Ontario. My favorite leaf growing up have to be Daryl Sittler. And I'd like to say hi to my wife, Tara Ostasevich, back home in Niagara-on-the-Lake, as well as my family and friends back home in Grimsby, Hamilton, and St. Catharines. Welcome back to Maple Leaf America. Nothing more American than college football. I'm inside the horseshoe where Buckeyes football is a religion. But it's not football season, as you can see. It's hockey season. And hockey season in Columbus means football. Recruiting, off-season training, looking ahead to autumn. 
Let's face it, it's always football season in Columbus. The ghost of coaching great Woody Hayes still looms large, and hockey will always take a back seat. The Buckeyes puck carriers, with some help from their professional friends down the street, are just hoping to sneak out from the gridiron shadows. Things never started here until after football. Now in the Blue Jackets, things start in uh, the end of August and September, and it's hockey season, and um, people are going to those games, you know, the, and uh, you know, we're a little bit more of a family, family value, so we can offer that to maybe the, the people who don't have the opportunity to get the corporate tickets, but we have a very good working relationship. Doug McLean has been great in the community and uh, good to us, and uh, Dave King and uh, Newell Brown, uh, the coaches, and, and uh, Drew Glant, they're, they've been great. We, we get along great, and um, we're, we're out to promote hockey, and we hope that uh, you know, they, they get their fans and they get their wins, and we hope they, we get our wins. Recently, the Buckeyes on ice have been getting some wins. In the past five years, Markell has brought unprecedented success. After 34 years of not reaching the National Collegiate postseason, OSU made it to the National Semifinals in 1998. They made the playoffs again the following year. Two current players were taken in the first round of the NHL draft this past summer. Great place to get an education here. I mean, uh, playing junior up in uh, Eastern Ontario, I mean, uh, you hope for uh, people to come and see you uh, once in a while. But uh, as an older player, I, I kind of developed a little older, so uh, the OHL is kind of... Uh, uh, not an option for me, so I mean, uh, when the Coach Markell and uh, his assistants came to talk to me, I thought it was a great opportunity for me to come play here. The Buckeyes now seek annual consistency in the very competitive Michigan-Michigan State-dominated Central Collegiate Hockey Association. I always wanted to come to a big school in the United States. It was just a big difference. A lot, of, a lot more people, that's what I wanted. The school, the business school, that's what I'm trying to get into. and. The big thing was my dad went here. He's actually alumni, three years. He played for the varsity team. So I'm just trying to follow in his footsteps. All my buddies, all the guys I've grown up playing against played in that league. Uh, you know, and it's too bad you can't do both. Uh, you know, I would have loved to have the opportunity uh, to play in the O, but, uh, you know, it, it, education's uh, really important, and uh, I didn't have a whole lot to fall back on. Say hockey didn't pan out for me, and uh, I wanted to get my education. Even if OSU slips as a national playoff contender this year, don't lose sight. The club is loaded with young talent. More than half the players are freshmen or sophomores. They'll be heard from right after the 2002 football season. State University and of course the home of the Columbus Blue Jackets. Next week we wrap up the series, Maple Leaf America. We will see you then.